Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's the Sunday of love. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. We light it and the candles of hope and peace again as we remember that Christ will come again and bring us everlasting peace and joy. The fourth key. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of love. Its light is meant to remind us of the love that God has for us. Jesus shows us God's perfect love. He is God's love in human form. The Bible says that God so loved the world and he gave us his only son. So what, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Love is patient, love is kind, and envies no one. Love is never boastful or conceited, rude or selfish. Love is not quick to take offense, it keeps no records of wrongs, it does not gloat over other people's troubles, but rejoices in the right, the good, and the true. There is nothing that love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, to its hope, to its endurance. Love never ends. We light this candle today to remind us of how God's love, perfect love, is found in Jesus. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your gift of love, shown to us perfectly in Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us prepare our hearts to receive him. Bless our worship. Help us to hear and do your word. We ask in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Stand and let's join together in our opening hymn number 201, Joy to the World. <laughs> seated. We welcome everyone to our fourth Sunday of Advent, uh, also Christmas Eve day, and we 
are delighted that you have opportunity to be with us this morning. If you've not yet done so, please sign the attendance pads and pass them along to your neighbors so that we can know of uh, your presence and if, if we can be able to help you, to reach out to you in any way, we'd be glad to do so. Uh, just a reminder, the announcements uh, for this coming week are a little different. Uh, this is that time of year where things begin to change, so please, before you come to the church or, or uh, reach out to somebody on staff, uh, take note of, of schedules, and if you leave a message, we will certainly be able to get back to you. A reminder of worship this evening, uh, the service, the formal service begins at 8 p.m. here in the sanctuary, of course, but as has been the tradition for many, many years in the life of our community of faith, uh, we will begin at 7.30 with offerings of uh, very special seasonal music, uh, a time to celebrate, rejoice, reflect. Please, please come and, and uh, hear uh, those, those offerings, those blessings of the season as it prepares you for a very special worship service this evening. We look forward to seeing you all here. Please come, bring your family and friends. You will be blessed. Uh, the choir will now continue as well. We uh, share our morning anthem. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who Though you have nothing, come, he is the offering, come, see what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born. Oh. 
as we come to God in a time of corporate prayer this morning, we anticipate, hopefully joyfully, the coming of the Christ child uh, this night and the celebration of tomorrow morning. But there are numerous uh, prayers of concern and comfort um, that uh, we need to share with you at this time. Um, first, uh, um, Beckett Swart uh, was diagnosed with COVID and flu and hospitalized yesterday. And our understanding is we're, we're hoping that Beckett will be able to be home today, but uh, um, we want to be praying for her. Ed Derby was hospitalized this past week and is back at the Rouse. Uh, Phyllis O'Neill uh, suffered a broken hip and is currently uh, at Warren Hospital, but we are awaiting news on whether she will be transferred to Erie or not. Um, Sherry Rowe was diagnosed with COVID and is at home. Um, there are others who have family members who are ill at this time. We share with you a name, Alan. Alan is in ICU at Hammett, uh, has suffered a, a, an aneurysm and is in very, very critical condition. Um, there's a connection to our congregation and we pray for that family. And then um, we pray for comfort and for peace uh, for uh, the family of Richard Brown, Nadine Huck's father, who's been ill for so long, uh, went home to be with the Lord um, this, this morning. And so we pray for family. And we give thanks that God watches over us in the challenges, the trials, and offers us blessing. There are so many other thoughts and concerns that fill our hearts. And I would just ask you to take those to God now as we bow in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, God Emmanuel, we give you thanks that on this day we might be together and, and be reminded of what it means to be one in Christ. And so we welcome the Christ child once again into our lives. We pray that as this season has unfolded, uh, for some it has gone far too quickly. For others, we cannot uh, arrive at its end soon enough. But whether it is joy or anxiousness that brings us to this moment, we pray, O oh God, that in this space, in this holy moment, you might just, just speak to our hearts, that you might fill us to overflowing, that your Holy Spirit might, might, might touch upon something in our lives that needs uh, to, to be uh, moved and, and prepared. And, and as we have come into this space, O oh God, we do so with anticipation. Use the, the carols that are sung, the prayers that are offered, the stories that are told, the message that is given. Use it all to remind us of the true meaning of the season, the meaning of, of having Christ in one's life. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would use this time, that the sick would be made whole, that those who mourn, would be comforted. That the stranger would be welcomed. The hungry fed. The prisoner cared for. The lost found. Use us in these moments, O oh God, to care for one another, to share with one another, to love one another. And ready us for this evening, a time of celebration and anticipation. 
we lift our prayers to you, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, the one who has come into our world as a baby, but has gone to the cross and has risen from a tomb, a Savior, who taught us to say together when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our praise and worship of God as we return gifts, tithe, and offerings.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to return to you blessings that we know have come from you. Receive these offerings that they might be used to make a difference in the lives of those who are among the least, the last, and the lost. For the joy that comes in receiving and for the blessing that comes in being able to give, we give you thanks. We pray it all in your most precious and holy name. Please be seated, and we invite uh, the children to come for their time. I don't do this part often, so we're going to stand and sing a hymn. Uh, 194. be seated. I don't know, is this working? Yes. Red, not green, that panics me. Okay, for everybody who doesn't get to sit by one of these guys, you get to see what it's, remember what it's like. <laughs> Hello, what happens tomorrow? What happens tomorrow? get our Christmas presents. Get your Christmas presents. So that must be what day is it? Christmas Day. Christmas Day. What do you do at your house to get ready for Christmas Day? What will you do tonight? Will you leave? Will you leave any? 
always the tractor. Will you leave anything for Santa? What? What? Milk and cookies. Milk and cookies, standard Santa fair. What else will you do? What will you hang up? You already have your tree ready, but you're right. We had to hang things on the tree. What are we going to hang up tonight? Stocking. Right. You hang up a stocking. What do you think you're going to get in the stocking? Why do you do that? You don't know? You hang up. Do you think you're going to get some gifts in your stocking that Santa and the elves picked out for you? I bet you these guys hope there's some lip gloss or possibly. <laughs> you don't get lip gloss? Oh dear. But Santa picks out things he thinks you want, or he thinks you need, or he thinks you would like, doesn't he? Yeah. And then and then you you get can anybody remember what you got in the stocking two years ago? No? No? I can't. You didn't? I cannot. You know, look at how old I am. I cannot remember. One year I think I got a yo-yo and the string was broken. That's the only thing I can remember in my stocking. And my brother thought he could work it even with the broken string. He was wrong. Okay. I have a question for you. What if... God packed your Christmas stocking. What could he put in it? What could he put in it? He could put what? Like, he could put prime in your stocking. Prime. Oh, okay. Prime is what? An energy drink. <laughs> we, I'm sure mom knows he doesn't need that. Okay. He could. He could put anything in there, couldn't he? Could he put a $100 bill in? Yeah. Could he put the whole world in? Yeah. This is God we're talking about. Could he do it? Uh, maybe. Now, I don't very often, hardly ever, guess what God would do. But I'm thinking that if God packed a stocking, he would put one thing in it. Let's see what that is. Mason, can you reach in here and see what's in there? Did you get anything? Is there anything in there, Mason? No. But you know what? God never tricks us, does he? Ever. So there has to be something in here. Let's Mason look again. Try way down at the bottom. Did you get anything? Get it out. Can you get it? Do you have it? It's a little tiny hand. Get it. Bring it out. What is that? Here, let's, let's show everybody and then you can tell us. What is that? What is that? It is a baby. Baby who, Mason? Jesus. Jesus. It's a baby Jesus. I think that that's what God would put in a stocking if he could only put one thing in because really that because really jesus is all we need isn't it okay guys so your church has for you the acolytes bring it they have something special for each of you and every year, if you listen to Pastor Mark long enough, he will eventually say, when you put your Christmas things away this year, leave one thing 
that reminds you of Jesus. Oh, so there you go. And I have a commercial. Laura, thank you for helping me sew all 36 stockings. So when we're going to say a prayer, and then you pick a baby Jesus in a stocking. Oh, and the tag says, we're going to let Mason's mommy read this because you guys are so shy. I'm not so shy. To my child from God. To my child from God. And we're all children of God. So let's say a prayer. Ready? Thank you, God, for Jesus. Please help us to keep him in our hearts all year. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew. We're going to start reading at chapter 2, verse 1, and read through verse 12. Hear these words. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out, secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you found him, report to me, so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went and looked, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them, until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. Falling to their knees, they honored him. They opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. So far, we've spent this Advent season, the first three weeks of it, working our way through a good many of the people who are present in our nativity scene. We've covered uh, Mary, and we've talked a little bit about Joseph. We've talked about her cousin Elizabeth and that miraculous conception. We've, we've talked about the angels overhead and the shepherds. And, and the one that we haven't gotten to yet is to talk about our wise men, our magi, if you will. And there's something intriguing to all of us, I think, about the wise men. They, they seem to hold a special place for us. They captivate us in ways that other visitors to uh, Jesus' birth don't. For instance, uh, we don't hear a whole lot of additional things about the, the shepherds, but I can recall 
that as a child in, in the Christmas pageants that I was a part of, everyone wanted to be one of the wise men. All of the boys at least wanted to be one of the wise men. I don't know whether it was because we thought the costumes were cooler or because it had the better speaking parts or what, but that was sort of the sought after part. And it seemed like the shepherd part was generally given to, to some of the younger kids because there wasn't a whole lot to say or, or a whole lot to do. And then of course, you know, you had Mary and Joseph standing there and they had almost no speaking part whatsoever. So we desired to be a part, one of the wise men. On top of that, we, when you think about some of the Christmas carols and the songs and the hymns that are out there, we've got a number of songs about, about the wise men. We Three Kings of Orient Are might be one of the, the first ones that comes to mind, um, but there are others. And if you've ever seen a Christmas cantata or a Christmas presentation, oftentimes there are a few solo parts in there where one or, one or a few of the men will step out and sing lines in the voice of one of the kings that were supposed to be there. Maybe it's the fact that the gifts kind of draw our attention to them. Gold and frankincense and myrrh have a, have a, special, a special kind of, of, of symbol, uh, some symbolism to us. Or, or maybe it's just the fact that they kind of stand out in the manger scene. They've got the, the brighter clothing, the, the, the gold and the gifts and the embellishments on their clothing. The fact that they've got a large camel generally standing with them. There are a number of things that draw our attention to the wise men. And yet, I find that story to be a bit of a conundrum in the Christmas remembrance. Because in the story that we just read this morning, which is the only biblical account of the wise men, there's no mention of so many of these details that we've added to their story. Much of what we, what we think about or talk about in terms of the wise men is what I would call extra biblical. It's not necessarily in opposition to what the Bible says, but it's not supported by anything that we find in the Bible. And in fact, probably their presence in the manger scene itself is the only thing that is contrary to what Matthew specifically tells us about that. So who are the wise men? Well, in the Greek, they're referred to as magi, which is the same root for which we get words like magician and, and magic. And in fact, if you remember the story in the book of Acts of Simon the sorcerer, where, uh, where he has an encounter with Peter and it doesn't go so well, um, it's that, the word that's used there to describe Simon the sorcerer is also the same word from which we get magi. And, and so they're, they're not kings per se, but they are, they, wise men might be a better term because they would, they would have been astrologers. They were likely uh, individuals in, in a particular community who spent their time studying the stars in, in, in hopes of finding explanations for things that were taking place in the world around them, or hoping to divine some sort of future expectation for what people should be looking for. They were, they were fortune tellers in the astrology sort of a sense, as though uh, telling the zodiac signs and things in modern day might be equated. And so uh, we, we, don't, we know that they weren't necessarily kings, but there probably or possibly weren't three of them either. We probably get that number from the gifts that are listed. One third century AD tradition holds that there were 12 of them. Um, other traditions hold that there were a great multitude that show up. Some suggest that there were only a few. There were at least two. But that's about all we know. The, the term magi is in fact plural, so there was more than one of them. But that's the closest thing to a number that we get. We also like to give them names, don't we? Melchior and Balthazar and Gaspar, and we, we say that they come from Arabia and Persia and India, and the Bible just tells us very simply that they came from the East. Why have we added these things? What, what is it about, about this whole visit that fascinates us? And then the last detail that I want to point out to us is, is that when Matthew speaks of their visit, he says that the star leads them to a house. They're no longer in a stable. They're no longer in a cave, but they're now in a house. And so they were likely not there on the night that Jesus was born. And in fact, were probably there sometime later when, when Jesus was, was a very young child. But nonetheless, we like to come up with explanations. We like to, we like to add to the story of the Magi. 
And we like to talk about the star, too. And in fact, there's a lot of work done to try to explain where the star that led them came from. Was it a, a supernova that occurred? Was it uh, a couple of planets that got very close together in the sky called a superconjunction that, that would have led them there? Was it a comet or some sort of a meteor shower that, that guided them? We come up with all of these different explanations, although most of those natural explanations, I would suggest, don't line up well with verse 9 that tells us that the star came and stood over a house to show them where Mary and Jesus were. Most comets don't stop and hang out over a house for very long. If we accept the miracle of the virgin birth, we probably ought to accept the miracle of God sending some form of light to guide and lead our wise men to where they are going. And there they find the baby and his mother and they offer their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then they head on their way to go find, to, to return to home. And they hear from God in a very real way through a dream saying, go back by a different route. Don't go back to Herod. So that's a whole lot of what we don't know about the wise men. So why is this story so important to us today? Well, I want to rewind us another 2,000 years or so from the visit of the wise men to Jesus. I want to take us to, to a broader vision of what God's narrative is. Because when we get stuck in the details of one particular story in the Bible, very often we come away with more questions than we do answers. But if we look at God's overarching story, the story that goes from the creation of everything in Genesis through the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and on to, to God's redemption and final glory and revelation, what we find is a much broader story that doesn't need minutia, but needs us to see God's big picture in it all. Do you remember the fellow Abraham? He started out as Abram. He had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Can you do the dance? Have you been in that Sunday school class? Okay, so Father Abraham, back in Genesis chapter 12, is given a promise by God. And that promise is that he will be the father of many nations, that he will have many children, and that the whole world, in fact, in verse 3 it says, that because of you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now that we know of in the Bible, God or Abraham only had two children. Um, and, and, and so to say that he was going to be the father of many children might leave us with some, some question regarding that. And then a few chapters later, we're told in chapter 15, Abraham trusted in the Lord, and the Lord recognized Abraham's trust and counted it to him as righteousness. It was counted to him as being righteous that he trusted in God. And if you recognize those words, but not necessarily from the book of Genesis, it's probably because they also show up in Romans chapter 4 and Galatians chapter 3 and in Hebrews chapter 11 in that passage that we refer to as the hall of faith, where, where we're reminded that Abraham was righteous because he believed in God. Not because of the good things that he did or the, the great things that he accomplished, but simply that he put his faith in God. And do you remember what that faith was? It was to get up and leave the land that he was in and follow God's promise to another land. And the Magi got up and left the land that they were in, and they followed God's promise to another land where they found the baby laying with his mother. Galatians chapter 3 tells us, Understand that in the same way that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, those who believe are the children of Abraham. But when it saw ahead of time that God would make the Gentiles righteous on the basis of their faith, Scripture preached in the gospel in advance to Abraham, all the Gentiles will be blessed in you. Therefore, those who believe are blessed together with Abraham who believed. According to the, the Apostle Paul, when God tells Abraham that he'll have many sons, he's not talking specifically of Abraham's sons, but all who come to inherit the righteousness of Abraham because of their faith. And this is, my friends, is why our Magi are so important to our Christmas story. Because the Magi are the story for us. For each and every one of us who is a Gentile, who is not a Jewish person, but still comes to faith and claims God's promise, the Magi are that representation. They came from a land far away. They followed a star, followed God's promise, and found the baby Jesus. 
And while the shepherds were out in the field and may have gotten that first uh, revelation that Jesus was born, it came because angels were screaming from the heavens, go and see the baby. But the magi, the magi were watching and waiting and longing for something to be. God's people, who should have been doing that, needed, needed angels from the sky, and yet those who were outside of God's promised people, the Israelites, were the ones who were the first to notice and say, there's something special going on here. There's a promise here for us. And, and so they bring their, their, their gifts, and they go on a journey, and they come to Herod, not the same Herod that hung, the Jesus, that hung Jesus on the cross, but another Herod that also had it out to see the king of the Jews put to death. Do you see where this is going? Do you, do you see how God's plan on a broader picture doesn't need the details of who the Magi were, but God's plan was to create a story that includes us, that includes all people from every nation, from every tribe, from the whole world who might come. But there's more to it than that, I think. You probably don't come to to the fourth Sunday of Advent, expecting to hear a sermon on evangelism, but that's what you're going to get this morning, because those magi were not believers in God. They were likely astrologers. They were likely priests of a different, of, of, of a different religion, and it was through their looking at the stars, through what they were, they were doing in their everyday life, that God reached out and had an impacting moment for them. That, that God was able to shape what they already knew, what they already thought, what they already saw, and draw them to the baby Jesus. And before you think that, that that's a suggestion that everybody goes to heaven, no, what I, wanna, what I want you to realize is that God moved them from what they were currently studying, what they were currently believing, what they were currently looking at, and drew them to kneel down and bow before Jesus. To kneel down and offer their gifts to Jesus. To place their hearts before Jesus and to recognize Jesus as king. But their improper belief didn't stand between them and coming to know God. It was used as a tool to show them what proper belief was. And that's an important message for us today because this world is full of improper belief. This world is full of, of other ways of thinking that aren't in a line with Christian thought. It's not politically correct for us to talk about things like religion at the family table, is it? Because we never know who we might offend. But maybe, maybe the Christmas table is the right place to talk about faith. In fact, maybe Christmas time is the best time for us to step out in evangelism. When else is the whole world focused on the same holiday that we're focused on? When else is the picture of a baby Jesus in a manger actually acceptable in a store? When else can we talk about God without concern of being pushed aside? Maybe we can't do it in the specifics we would want to, but the world's a little bit open to it right now. A little bit more than they are, say, in June, July, or August. And so as we begin to think about that, we can think about the ways that we might share our faith even in the midst of this misappropriated holiday. And this is where I have to take a moment and stop and confess to you all that I, I struggled on Facebook the other day because I was scrolling through and I found an ad. And the ad was for a t-shirt. And the t-shirt had a picture of a manger scene on it. And in that, in the caption below the manger scene was said, Rejoice in the birth of a brown-skinned Middle Eastern undocumented immigrant. And I'll be honest with you, my Jesus is not blonde-haired and blue-eyed, nor is he a little white boy. He is, in fact, a brown-skinned Middle Eastern individual. That's where he was born. But when I got to the part about the undocumented immigrant, and I thought about the Jesus story, well, Mary and Joseph got up and left their town and traveled to Bethlehem so that they could be counted in the census. We've misappropriated that story. But this was where I got it wrong. Because I decided to post a comment under that ad that talked about everything that was wrong in that. And let's all be honest, militant comments on social media don't get you very far ever in changing people's mind, right? That wasn't the way to go about handling that moment. And as I've reflected on it in the week or two since then, what I've realized is there was a door that was opened. 
And rather than stepping through it and creating an opportunity for a conversation, I effectively slammed it shut. When we start taking our ideas militantly to the world, no one's going no to go for that. God didn't bring Jesus militantly into this world. God bought Jesus as a humble baby. God brought wise men who were studying the stars for a different religion to bear gifts to the Christ child. And God creates openings throughout the holiday season for us to begin to share our faith, even in the midst of people who understand the purpose of this holiday the wrong way, right? But we still have an opportunity because we're all talking about this holiday. So here's the question. Who do you need to talk to today about the Christmas story? Who do you know that maybe doesn't have a full understanding of the real story of Christmas. Because rather than saying, this is everything that's wrong with what this post was, if I saw somebody wearing that t-shirt, I might say, tell me what you believe about the Christmas story. And as they begin to talk, I have an opportunity to share a, a different belief, a different way of viewing the Christmas story, a different way of talking about it. Tell me what you believe Christmas is really about, because this is what I believe it about. And listen to the person. And then share your own story. This might be the one of the few times when you can talk to somebody about the real meaning of Christmas. This afternoon might be one of the few times when you can pick up the phone and call somebody and invite them to come to church with you tonight. And they'll say yes. Because they're not coming to church. They're coming to the Christmas Eve service. And it feels different. And it sounds different. But it's not. We're still worshiping our God. And we still have an opportunity to invite people along. So I invite you to see what remains of the Christmas season from now till this evening or, or on till when, whenever you still feel like you can. To use this as an opportunity to share faith. To share the Christmas story the way we understand it with the world who doesn't understand it quite the right way. I invite you to find common points. To find places and spaces where you can begin to open up that conversation, but don't feel like you have to have it all in one moment. Open a door and begin to step through it and begin to share faith this Christmas season. I invite you to go in God's grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the Christmas story. We thank you that there's something in this story that still rings true in the world. We thank you that the story of a baby born in a manger captivates the imaginations of even the atheist and the agnostic. But God, we pray that you would tame our tongues, that you would help us to use our words this holiday season in a way that helps to guide people to the love that you shared through the, through the gift of your son, Jesus. Help us to be meek and mild, but to stand for what we believe. Help us to show your love to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and sing our closing hymn?
as you leave this place, I pray that God would bless your celebrations over the next few days. That as you rejoice and celebrate with family, as you get together with friends, as you share Christ's story, God would fill you with his Holy Spirit and that you would go in grace and peace. And I pray that as you go about your family celebrations, if those celebrations include sorrow and fear and worry and hurt, that you would know that the same God fills you with his Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would know his peace in those moments. But my friends, go in the grace of God, with the love of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, shouting like the angels, worshiping like the wise men, and guiding people to Christ like the star. Amen.